He has a master's degree from Aarhus University Denmark English program, and he is interested in human cognition and psychology and how this influences how we uh, imagine magical uh, and supernatural events, worlds, and how these structures are reflected in culture, literature, uh, and so on. He, uh, his primary interest is uh, history and the mechanism of modern fantasy, but he's also been working in the intersection of fantasy fiction and religious uh, belief. Uh, and uh, he's also very interested in ludonarrative studies. Uh, and uh, if I remember this correctly, you just basically, you are uh, just more or less uh, st uh, are about to start your uh, PhD uh, project. Is that correct? I, I just applied to start it. So I'm hoping for a okay. uh, positive uh, reply well, back. We'll have, our, we'll have our fingers crossed. And now hear your presentation about spoilers as world building and world building as spoilers in fantasy fiction. Thank you so much for the uh, for the introduction, and thank you so much uh, everyone for coming here and seeing this, uh, hearing my talk on this fairly niche subject on the role of spoilers as world building and world building as spoilers in modern fantasy fiction. Uh, not just modern fantasy fiction, but that will be kind of our primary area of uh, of focus. Um, and I could launch right into this, but there's probably a few uh, preliminary things we need to get out of the way. Uh, when we talk about fantasy fiction, uh, be it really literary fantasy fiction or fantasy movies, fantasy television shows, et cetera, et cetera, we almost inevitably run into the issue of world building. Uh, fantasy tends to take place in worlds that somehow differ from ours. There is almost invariably, not always, but almost invariably, some kind of supernatural conceit that clearly differentiates the type of world we're in and the rules it operates by from our own. And kind of the Ur example of this, I mean, you can't say the history of fantasy without saying uh, Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. Uh, and that means you also kind of have to touch on what came before Tolkien and some of the world building before that. And I think one of the most prominent examples there is uh, The Hyborian Age by Robert E. Howard setting of the old Conan and the barbarian stories. Uh, and this whole trajectory, there's a, such a huge tradition of this elaborate building of a fictional reality with a history, with a cosmology, uh, with characters and settings and landscapes and metaphysics, rules of magic and whatnot, uh, that Dana Wynne Jones, a uh, fantastic author as well, she lampooned the entire thing in The Tough Guide to Fantasyland Anyone with an interest in the history of fantasy fiction, I think should read this book. It is hilarious um, and very, very informative. But this kind of leads us to uh, uh, an awkward thing fantasy fiction always has to wrestle with uh, when we read it. And that's the issue of exposition. Because having an elaborate constructed reality and all this background, all this, uh, as the modern term apparently is lore, which I think is a strange term for this, uh, but all this background lore, uh, in, you need to present that in some way. In other words, fantasy fiction tends to really need uh, to have exposition. Um, and exposition uh, can be very boring when it's done poorly. I think we're all kind of familiar with, uh, all can think of examples of movies or books where there is just a massive dump of information about the background. And this, this just doesn't just happen in fantasy, but it's a common problem in fantasy. And we, the reader or the viewer just loses interest because none of this seems at all dramatically relevant. It just seems like a bunch of names and a bunch of information. And we're not really sure what to make of it. Now, the way a lot of fantasy then works around this problem is to make the presentation of exposition storyable. It makes that presentation dramatic. Uh, and thus, in a sense, the presentation of the world and its conflicts and the background we need to understand the conflict and the story becomes the story. Uh, there's a gradual reveal. There's a tendency more and more over the decades towards a very overt dramatization of exposition. Um, and that's a, I think that's kind of a critical development because 
Uh, in order to understand why that is, I think we need to look at earlier types of fantasy and what they tried to do and how they presented information. Generally, we see two frameworks of uh, world building, so to speak, in early fantasy. Uh, there's some overlap between these two archetypes, but generally we have what we can call a mythopoetic backdrop, mythopoetic uh, or mythopoeia, myth making. Uh, this is kind of exemplified in the likes of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, uh, Lord Dunsany also to a, to a lesser extent. Uh, and this tends to be very heavy on self-referentiality. There's a tendency towards an omniscient narrator. Uh, and there's a, a tendency of these stories to exist in very deliberate webs, where if you're interested in some part of this mythos, you can examine some other story in it, and you will kind of that way have deepened your understanding of the mythos as a whole. Uh, and in that way, the stories tend to kind of mutually inform and deepen and elaborate each other. There's this presentation of the material as if they are chapters in an in a anthology of, of legends or chapters in a history book even. Uh, but speaking of anthologies, I think the other backdrop that's worth keeping in mind is the anthological backdrop. Uh, and this is very much present in the old pulp fantasies. Uh, yeah, Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, the works of Clark Ashton Smith, even Lovecraft, where very much is, each story has a cool idea that it wants to explore and go with. And then it may or may not suggest a larger world outside of that. Uh, these stories tend to ha not have omniscient narrators uh, and they tend to not really be, in, be very interested in elaborating on their world, uh, but they do still tend to suggest quite a lot about the world, uh, which means that these stories tend to uh, really make use of this fruitful vacuum between each other to suggest a much larger world, but we're getting these highly focalized, highly personally inflected views of the suggested larger world within these pieces of the anthology, um, which one of the reasons that these types of anthologies tend to be really, really well suited for open world kind of imagination. Um, Famously, Lovecraft and Howard uh, had correspondences and were kind of pen pals. And there's some references to Lovecraft in Howard, if you look close enough, and there's some references to, uh, and vice versa, yeah. So that kind of brings us to a general attitude in both the mythopoeic and the anthological way of writing fantasy, both modes that were highly influenced by the, the kind of local conditions that these writers we're uh, producing texts under. Um, but that is that metaphysics and cosmology and history are kind of hard to spoil. This is the type of information of the world that we see in these tales that influences, but does not directly dictate uh, the content of each story. Uh, much in the same way as, well, it's hard to spoil the ending of the Hundred Years' War uh, you can say it's hard to spoil uh, what happens during the first age of Middle Earth. It's just a part of the mythology, and you can deepen that knowledge. Uh, but can you spoil it? It's a, it's, it's a difficult question. And certainly these writers at the time weren't particularly uh, uh, concerned with the idea of their stories being, or their universes being spoiled, because the information was presented in a way that wasn't particularly dramatic in the first place. Uh, so at first glance, it may appear that metaphysics and cosmology and history aren't, are kind of hard to spoil. Or are they? Uh, because fantasy changes. Fantasy is today an incredibly diverse genre and it started to diversify quite early on. And throughout the 70s and the 80s and towards today, uh, we see a much more experimentation with narratical modes and with the presentation and with strategies of world building and of presenting that world building. And it becomes increasingly common for the characters in fantasy stories to have imperfect knowledge of their own world and for there to be a lack of a omniscient 
unfocalized narrator, narrator who mediates the world to us. In the mythopoetic backdrop, we tend to have a kind of Homeric uh, bard voice sometimes that, that mediates the world directly to us as readers. And the anthological backdrop and framework tends to be not super concerned with the details of the world anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. It tends to matter a lot in modern fantasy. And we see this dramatization of exposition happen more and more and more. And I just very quickly want to contrast, uh, as, because I think this is such a, a, a telling example, uh, the Lord of the Rings with Harry Potter. We're not talking just about the story here, but we're talking about the information about the world, the magic systems, the metaphysics, the cosmology, all these things, the history, all these things that are at stake in the world and how they're presented. In Lord of the Rings, you're presented with the wonderful, wonderful Ballantine covers from the, uh, from the 70s. Uh, less than 100 pages in, we have the conversation in Bag End where Gandalf tells Frodo, this is the ring of power. This is who the Dark Lord Sauron is. You should be incredibly concerned that this is happening and you probably have a quest on your hands. Okay, cool, great. Um, Harry Potter, when, do we, when are we actually told what a Horcrux is? And quite crucially that Harry Potter is, has a very, very important role in uh, the metaphysics surrounding Voldemort's immortality and so on and so on. I stopped counting after about 4,000 pages, um, but it's only really in the last book. Uh, it's incredibly late in the story that this seemingly crucial piece of world building information is actually given. Uh, and of course, that doesn't mean that, that this is the only type of spoiler uh, information that you can have in uh, um, in fantasy fiction. Uh, fantasy fiction can include stuff from all the kind of common uh, plot twists, everything we can see in any, any type of genre from change of motivation to all the common plot twists can still occur, obviously. But I think fantasy kind of uniquely displays the spoiler centered around the revelation of the true nature of the world and its magical metaphysics, its, its rules, so to speak. And that tends to kind of massively complicate the entire question of when can we say something is story information? When can we say something is background information? When can we say something is part of the mythos or part of the story? It complicates so many of the already really thorny questions fantasy tend to have about uh, its own textual elements. Uh, and I, 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 I I, I've seen similar things in some types of modern science fiction, uh, which shares the idea of fantasy is that there's some kind of divorce from reality and some fictional rules we have to abide by. And that these rules in a lot of modern fantasy just tend to be very, very obscured and uh, only delivered, oh, there we go, uh, only delivered fairly late. Uh, in fact, when it is uh, dramatically opportune for the story to do so. Uh, I think this has something to do with the change in the production and the reading of fantasy fiction in general. Uh, fantasy fiction today tends to be presented in a much more highly controlled and sequential uh, way of reading than Tolkien or Howard or the old pulp writers did. Uh, if you read a Conan story, there was no guarantee you had any access to any of the other Conan stories. And Tolkien had a very different vision. Uh, he wanted to emulate mythos and history and so on and so on. Uh, but today, things are much more tightly controlled. If you want to read the entirety of Game of Thrones, uh, you can do so. You can pick it up as an ebook easily. Chances are your bookstore has it. You have easy access both to the spoilers but you also have much more easy access to the works themselves than you had even just uh, half a century ago. Um, and I think that gives an impetus to dramatize exposition in a way that we didn't really see before. Uh, we see much more this trend of, of authors withholding, frankly, story crucial information until it is dramatically opportune and the mediation of this information happens 
entirely through focalized and character inflected experiences of the universe. So in other words, exposition becomes world building and world building becomes exposition and all that creates story. Oh, and I have a few examples here that I would love to talk about uh, just because I think they all kind of show ways that this can go. I realize that I'm running the, towards the tail end of the presentation here, so I'll be quick. Uh, one of the most famous works of fantasy overall, even in, especially in modern times, is George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, adapted into the Game of Thrones television show. Uh, personally, I think that this series really, really suffers from withholding information uh, because we are, what, more than 6,000 pages into the story and we still don't actually know in the book series what the big metaphysical or cosmological stakes or information really is, uh, which I think is interesting, but I also think as a reader, it, it is somewhat infuriating. Um, Brandon Sanderson, who is a very prolific modern fantasy writer, this, uh, first book in his Mistborn series, uh, The Final Empire, uh, is kind of a master at creating very satisfying plots where there is this moment of revelation, not just exposition, but capital R revelation about the true nature of things. He has all these complicated magic systems that tend to have really interesting ways in which they interact, but some of the interactions aren't revealed before very, very late in the story. Uh, and he really, really is, I think the modern epitome of making world building into a spoiler and spoiler into world building. Um, N.K. Jemisin, uh, fantastic stuff. Also uh, the, the, uh, the fifth season, which won uh, all the awards and its sequels also won all the awards. Fantastic read, it's a trilogy. It has the advantage of being a constrained short story, uh, or short story as in a short story, but it's a fairly short trilogy. Uh, and it can kind of, it, it, has, it, it doesn't draw out in waiting for the big revelations, uh, which I think Sanderson's work can do a little bit, but that's a, high, a completely subjective opinion. Uh, and then lastly, Richard Scott Baggers, uh, this is the first, um, uh book in his second apocalypse series and it is uh it does incredibly interesting things with teasing that there are that there's something amiss that all the views we're being told by the characters of this world are, are imperfect and then when we actually through other characters with superior knowledge of the true nature of things are told the, the real nature of the world uh it goes really, really interesting places. It's not for the faint of heart. It is an incredibly dark series. Uh, I think it is wonderful, uh, but uh, if anything deserves a content warning on the front cover, it is, it is this series. It is bleak, uh, but it is wonderful. Um, so I think this trend really is very, very visible in modern fantasy. And in fact, I'm hard pressed to think of a lot of major series within the last, 15 years or so that doesn't do this in some way. Uh, and I think it is such an interesting development to have seen in this genre that has a reputation, deservedly or not, for being somewhat stale in its storytelling formulas and being very formulaic, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but which actually does very interesting things uh, with exposition, with world building, and therefore, creates very, very interesting situations to discuss vis-a-vis -vis the subject of spoilers. Um, thank you. <laughs>